Good day, everybody. Welcome to Shepherd's Corner, having conversations with Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon from the Archdiocese of Port of Spain. Now, the Archbishop has been taking us on a little synodal journey. You all remember that? You know, and um, sometimes people just do like the word synod. You know, they say, oh, God, synod again. But I just want to reflect on, on, on the last five shows that we've done, plus the sixth show today, you know, where he spoke about communal discernment, you know, loading, loading. You remember the, the, the new iOS system? Then we spoke about community, moved by community to discernment, opening up of our spiritual toolkit. Remember the different levels of the toolkit? And then he, then he told us about my dream of a synodal church. And then last week we dealt with making the dream of a synodal church a reality. And as you can see behind me, we're looking at some kind of roadmap, right? The roadmap to our dream of a synodal church. So yes, guys, it's talking synod, but I want us to, to look at how the Archbishop has been leading us on this journey. That's what synod is, and is a journey together. So let us welcome Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon. Good day, sir. How are you? I am doing really, really well. But I think by now people should know if they see I write one article, two articles, three articles, four articles, five articles, they know what's coming next. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> they know what's happening. Hey, we know what's happening. We know what's happening. You know what's coming next. You know a book coming out of all of this. Hey, yeah, they didn't have to say that. I got to drop that on them. You see, the, you see my roadmap? It's leading to a book. <laughs> It, 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 at the end of it is a book. But it's the first time though that the book came before the articles. You know? uh -huh. The first time that, that usually uh, the articles would be written and say, hey, that's a book. And I go back. This time after the third article, I said, wait. And and the other chapters started to come. So I've pre pre-written um before the articles are coming, which is not a not a bad thing to to do and, and uh, is a new experience for me. It's beautiful. So how do we get to our dream synodal church? And you have to remember the, the dream now is not my own, you know. It's our dream because it came from us. It came from many, many engagements. It came from many experiences. It came from all kinds of interactions. So it's it's our it's our experience. It's 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 what I've heard and what I've gleaned and what I've brought together from us. So that's a that's a real question. You ever you know you ever went to London? Yes, yes, I've been to London a number of times. You ever rode the underground in London? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that when you ride the underground in London that you always hear is mind the gap. Mind the gap. Mind, mind the gap. They're talking about the gap between the train and the platform. But in this case, is the gap between where we are and this synodal church of our dreams. How do we mind the gap between the where we are? and the synodal church of our dreams? And how do we close that gap every day so that that gap is no longer a chasm that is taking us into uncharted places, but it becomes a, a, a small step that we make every day along that perilous journey that you have behind you towards the synodal church that Jesus wants for us. We got to mind that gap. We really have to mind that gap. And first, what's my first gap? Um, you you say is a lack of discipleship. And, 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 and I want to talk about that. I, I want you to develop that. You said first, a lack of discipleship greatly impacts the church's current state of Christ's intended vision. Now, you know, I just want to let the people outside there know, you know, a number of the AEC deacons met. You know, this is an oh, interesting thing. Goodness. We met, you know, we met last evening. And you know this gap you're talking about? That was interesting. Mm -hmm. It came up without them even reading the article. So I just mm -hmm. telling you the gap. Mm -hmm. Mind the gap. So 
it might sound counterintuitive to people when they hear that the biggest gap is a discipleship gap. And I want to make the, dis the, the distinction between people in the pew and disciples. And I think it's an important dis distinction to be made between people in the pew and disciples. Disciples are people who commit their life to Jesus Christ. People in the pew are people who are committed and sometimes culturally committed, but not yet necessarily committed at the three or four levels of discipleship, which we will explore. But uh, I want to make the distinction because we are all on the journey to authentic discipleship. Mm -hmm. Wherever you are, there is more road ahead of you than behind you, wherever you are. And so it's not to say, well, the Archbishop said I'm not a disciple. No, 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 no. I'm saying we are on the journey to, and the gap is the road ahead of you. You've already traveled some road, but there's road ahead of you that we must travel together. You know, and that, 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 that reflects, you know, something that I always challenge. I always challenge those in the pews, you know, because when I look at, especially we, we're looking at post, post COVID, when we are seeing less people in the pews, Right, I always challenge him. I said, "Have you invited somebody to attend Holy Mass or service? You know, yeah. or are you keeping this your own secret? So, yeah. as a my disciple, devotion. yeah, my as personal like, devotion, and yeah. and and that's where the discipleship gap is because a disciple not only loves but shares the faith, not only lives the faith." Believes the faith. So before Christ ascended, he instructed disciples to make more disciples. So if you are in the business of making disciples, then you are a disciple. And you're on your way on the discipleship journey. But if you are not calling other people to discipleship, to participation, to communion, to mission, then you are disciple, but we have we have ways to travel. We have ways to travel. And and you know, you need a GPS, you know, these days. <laughs> hey, I am an old school guy, but a new school guy. So I work with my GPS, you know, but also, but, hey, we need a map. We need a map. No, no, no. A GPS is a God positioning system. Yeah, <laughs> you need a, a God positioning system, and sometimes when you have your God positioning system on, and you have to turn it on, eh? sometimes you're here recalculating. <laughs> That's when when you're gone the wrong way, and the conscience tell you recalculate that journey you're making, recalculate it because because you're off course right now. So Christ asked his disciples to make disciples. And this is crucial. The church's vitality, I believe, depends on its ability to disciple in a consistent fashion across cultures, languages, and generations. You know, I, I, I think that's, if you ask mm -hmm. me, what is the, the one thing that the church must do everywhere and at all times it is forming disciples glad what you said there you know it uh, it must be consistent i want to see that because consistency is also a discipleship's quality a quality of a disciple yeah. because sometimes you know you just try once and puts that taking you on <laughs> and, you, and you just say well i give up on that one you know it must be consistent you know, across cultures. I love that. Languages and generations. Inclusivity. I like to call that inclusivity. Inclusivity. 
I mean, the, the, the person who invited me back, invited me, I can't count the number of times, you know. <laughs> really, and I don't know how they kept inviting me, but they, they were persistent and consistent. And they kept inviting. I used to laugh and say, you must be crazy about that mad people. I used to get all kinds of excuses. And and they and one day when they invited, I was at the place where I could have heard the invitation. And I and I said, okay, this afternoon? They said, yes. What time to pick you up? And I think they were in shock. <laughs> but that's just to say that if they had given up in inviting the day when I needed that invitation and when I was more now disposed to answer, because the evening before I walked out of church and I said, you see me, I don't know what sense that made, you know, and, and I, I really don't know. Why did I come here this evening? And I heard myself saying to myself, I don't know if I'm coming back unless I find a good reason. I heard myself saying that. And the next day when I received the invitation for the how many ever time, I simply said, what time? Yeah, okay, I'll pick you up. Because maybe about 15 times before that, maybe more, I laugh, a ridicule, a, 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 a shame. A, a... But the invitation never stopped. And the day that I needed the invitation, the invitation also came. Amen. That, that's that's discipleship. Amen. That's Amen. The model we're talking about. Because you never know when a person needs to hear that invitation. You never, never know. And, and if that person had given up after the first or second time and said, not me and him now, he he um he too this, he too that, he da 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 I'd have not heard the invitation the day I needed it. Praise be to God. And I think that that is, that is such a wonderful lesson to kind of share with people. You know, don't give up. Be persistent. You actually use that word. You, be, you use a word the last time, you know, when you were describing Anne-Marie's persistence. But I can't remember what it is right now, but there was a special word. Okay. But yes, no, it's a, it's a, it's a persistence. And, and that's why we have to consistently form disciples. And that means inviting people to a Life in the Spirit seminar, to mass, to a prayer meeting, to a rosary group, to a talk, to something that you feel would, 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 would itch, would get at their itch and help them to make the bridge between where they are and the faith that God is calling them to. Now, and I think that that is, that is quite amazing. We used to be, we used to excel at, at forming disciples in our institutions of the family, the school, and the parish. They used to be excellent in forming disciples in their own way. But I think somehow we've lost our way in this. You know for the family, you know for the school, and you know for the parish. We, we are no longer excellent in forming disciples in these three these three spaces. Why could you what, 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 no, 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 my question is why? Why? Why have we lost our way in terms of you know championing and being disciples? You know, first I want you to, to think deeply with me on this. Have we lost our way? You you're assuming I'm right, eh? But I, I am assuming you're right because I, when I look, just like what I said, you know, I look and I'm seeing only empty pews, empty pews, empty pews. I see. Look, wait a minute. What have we lost? Have we lost our our, you know, I guess drive to be disciples to share the good news? Do we believe? My question is sometimes: Do I truly believe that what I'm encountering when I come to church, when I receive these sacraments, do I truly believe that I am encountering the living God, the one who loves me, the one who died for me, the one who rose from the dead? And do I truly believe that? Because if I truly believe that, I mean, I want to share this. And and that's the that's the whole point of it. That 
there is something that is missing amongst us right now that we just have to get at. Why, why is it we are on a playing a defense position when it comes to sharing our faith? No, 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 I don't, I don't want to burden anybody with that. I mean, the extreme form of that is, is young people growing up Catholic and say, no, 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 we don't want to burden our children with the faith. When they're of age, they'll decide for themselves. Well, let them decide what school they're going to, what pampas to use, whether to be breastfed or, or to be fed out of a bottle. Let them decide whether, um, whether you're going to potty train them or not. In fact, let them, let them when they wake up and they, they're old enough, decide if they want to be potty trained. Like that. I like that, Archbishop D. That's a nice analogy, Archbishop D. I love it. Faith. Let them decide. If, if we're going to let them to de decide something as important as the faith, well, then what is potty training and what is formula versus breastfeeding? Huh? What is, what is that? Then in this, if, if you think a little child is capable of deciding major stuff, let them decide whether to brush their teeth or not. Let them decide. <laughs> you know? But, but it, is the, it, is, it is where we have come to that really makes no sense. We are playing a defensive position right now when it comes to the faith. And, and we have to ask ourselves why. We have to ask ourselves why. You know, this is going to take us on a big, 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 deep conversation. You know, this, this roadmap here, I don't think it's long enough, you know, because this is a serious conversation that Absolutely. you're on. Absolutely. And that's why I'm asking people to think deeply about this comment. Because I want you to consider your experience alongside those of the older and the younger generation. Have all the generations experienced the same discipleship or is it different in the different generations? And I think that that's, that's really the big, the really, really big question that we're asking. So remember it's across generations, remember it's across cultures, languages, it's across everything. But just for us, I think, my grandmother's generation understood discipleship very differently from my mother's generation, very differently from me, and very differently from those who are coming up right now, for better or for worse. Okay? For better or for worse. But it's different. It's very different. Catholic participation was very high in the 1960s. Everybody knew if you miss church, you committed a mortal sin. You, if, if a truck lick you down, you're going to hell. Everybody, everybody participated at a high degree. Was it really discipleship or was it fair driven? Or was it loyalty? And I, I think there's a, a mixture. I, and I have no doubt there are people in, in, in that generation, which we call the great generation, who participated out of a devotion for Christ and a love for him. I, I, you know, and I have no doubt about that because every generation produces its sins. Every generation. I'm glad you said that. Sins. I'm glad you said that, you know, because sometimes, you know, your, your parents would force you. You better eat that bhaji, eh? Or else it's you and I. You know what I mean? Or you better take your carnival right tablets. Or else it's you and I. No, that was kind of fear-driven, but... In the end, hey, you're not taking on cordial tablets. I don't get the call. You're not eating my vegetables and so on. Even though my father forced me to eat it. I am okay. seeing the fruits of that. But All right. that's that's one way of looking at it. For me, it was a green fig every day. Every day. <laughs> I am. I am. I have no doubt now it is what made me resilient and strong. You know? I have no doubt about it. But anyway. Now, previously... I would say in the former generation, there was a much higher participation. And I would say social conformity with the faith. Was this genuine discipleship? That's, that's another question, I think. The old culture was authoritarian. It was fear-driven. It, and it, it excluded the non-conformists. And, and, and that 
exclusion was very clear. If if um somebody got married outside of the church, you couldn't go to that wedding. And and even going to that house was a was a, a, a little taboo. So there was there were those things. But today's vision that emphasizes building community inclusivity and dialogue requires a very, very different approach from the approach that we had in the in the former generations. And we have to see that. So whether whether that was real discipleship, and I have no doubt it made sense, whether it it was fear driven or out of love, well, we could debate that at nausea. But what we what we do know is that the the essence of discipleship today and where the church is going today is different from where the church went a, a generation or two ago. I think that um that came out a lot in 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 our deacons meeting conversations with the spirit with the, in terms of the deacons and building discipleship you know and and, and that came out you know the older generation kind of you know work with that but your newer generation they're asking questions and you, you have know. to have the answers correct you can't say because i tell you so now i think the older generation had a higher participation from its members and a greater capacity to pass the faith or to socialize people as Catholics than our generation has. The method, the method and, and some of the values that propel the former culture are not going to work today. Eh? They, they can't work today. And that's the problem that we have, that we, we're still using a default at the back of our mind for discipling that is not productive and can't attract people to discipleship in the culture today. Remember, it has, it's across all cultures, all generations, all languages, all people. Then that means that each culture, you have to understand the culture, what, what gets it, and then have the conversation within that for discipleship to be able to stick. You know, many, many people say, many people talk to us, you know, as, as deacons and as priests, and they say, well, well, you don't preach the fire and brimstone anymore. <laughs> what do you need to preach? You know, that, hey, if you say you're going to go to hell, you know, and I hear that mainly from the older generation. And I'm not saying no. Because I think it everything has its place to remind people sin Correct. is real and hell is real. Absolutely. And and you don't want to be on a roadmap going in that direction. Turn your GPS on. That's your conscience. And if it tell you recalculating, recalculate, change direction, and head in the right direction, that is called repentance. That is repentance. In, in, at this Easter time, I'll only have one thing to say. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, You're glad you can see the hallelujah word now, eh? <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> but here's the real challenge that I think that we're facing. Most of the people handing faith on to the next generation uh, are consciously passing the faith today. Most of them their cultural default is a Catholicism from an age gone by. And, and part of the problem is this generation has an allergic reaction to the authority, to the, to the you have tos, to all of the cultural codes of Catholicism of a, of a generation gone by. And so you have those who can pass the faith on are passing it on with a culture that is not essential to the faith that, that this generation is becoming allergic to. You understand the problem? I can't believe my Archbishop telling me that they are allergic. Yes. <laughs> no, they, uh, give me a better word. They break out in highs. 
They shut down quickly. Once you start with you have to, you must um, with this generation. No, you what you what you need is to give a reason why. What you need is a, a rational explanation. Fitting it into the bigger story, showing it from the Bible. That's what you need to do. But once you start and once you say, sit down, be quiet, listen up, allergic, you know. Because they're barely taking that in school right now. Far less for receiving the faith. And so we have a real challenge in handing the faith on to the next generation. Now the fathers of the Second Vatican Council went back to sources. And I think that that's where we have to go now. It's called Resosma and Agenamento. Two very key words from the Second Vatican Council. And they were about reinterpreting the Catholic culture based on the original sources and a long tradition of faith to meet the critical challenges of the present. So the resurrection of the, or the restoration of the diaconate the, the came out of Rizosma and Agenimento because for a long time they had no deacons in the church. Huh? Going back to the original sources, we saw, oh, there were deacons in the early church. And therefore, why do we not have now? And that becomes a, a, a restoration of an ancient rite based on these two critical principles. But what's important, what's important is that we must understand the, the challenges that we need to meet today and in understanding those challenges, we have to go back to the ancient sources, to the traditions, to the faith, and, and pull from, from the ancient sources what is required for faith today. That's, that's so important. And, and you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that whole thing about the diaconate, because a lot of people didn't realize that the diaconate, you know, had, the, the, there, was, there were no permanent deacons in the Catholic Church for quite some time. And coming out of Vatican II, they went back to the original, you know, the original discipleship, you know, and the formation of disciples to grow, to grow the discipleship. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's important because, you know, there again, we, we you know, what the, 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 the disciples, which were the apostles and the deacons, they recognize, okay, listen, what is my mission? What, what's God, what's my vocation? What's my real vocation? What's God calling me to? And yeah. all, all, both the apostles as the deacons and the priests, it's yeah. the discipleship. Yeah. All right. The first vocation is discipleship because the first vocation is holiness. What is God calling all of us to? Holiness. And when you understand that, we understand the, the other way forward. So, we have to go back to sources and we have to understand discipleship in ways that are more relevant to the times in which we are living, to the culture, to the language, to the people in which we are, we are living today. And that, that I think, is, is vital. I really think it, it's a vital move. So that means if you're going to call forth disciples, then you have to have evangelization. You have to have evangelization. At, at Jesus' last meeting with his disciples before his ascension, it's in Matthew's gospel. Matthew states, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. The gospel of the Lord. Mm -hmm. the gospel of the day. Jesus is saying some really important and intriguing things there, you know. He's saying, go, 
go make disciples. Tell them to go. Now, what's intriguing is some worshipped and some didn't. Some was, doubted. Yeah, that, that, some hesitated. You know what was amazing is then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So, hey, this is the, this is the big 11, right? Yeah. And still some doubted. Another text says some hesitated. I like the word hesitated. I like it's a it's a beautiful word, you know. Now, and and here's here's the thing. To worship is to give worth to. And that means to make most valuable in your life. That means to orient everything around that which is most valuable. And if you're not worshiping, you're hesitating or you're doubting, then you are not making, giving worth to God as supreme and as most valuable. And, and therefore, what you're actually doing is living by, with, a, with an idol. You put something in a place that only God should have. No, no, no. I want the flood we have work on this. I like what you said, that some translations said, they hesitated. I'm going to hesitate. You know why? Because when they think about, hey, to be a true disciple means I had to take that cross, I had to get nailed, whipped, beaten, and, and crucified. Now, nah, I go hesitate. I can see the hesitation. I can see the hesitation. I just say. Mm -hmm. So, what, what we have here, though, in the hesitation of the disciples or the doubt of the disciples is a modern phenomenon. Some are hesitating. Some are doubting. Some are going forward and giving everything. But we have to see that. So we first need to recognize that some worship, some did not worship. And, and I think this is a fundamental challenge. Are you at a place in your life where you can freely, consistently worship Jesus Christ and make Christ most important in your life? Not all disciples can do that. Some hesitate. Some are hesitating right now. And this is an ancient problem. And it's also a modern problem. Ask the question, do you believe Jesus is God? and deserving of our worship? That's the real question. Do you believe Jesus is God and deserving of our worship? Which is the highest worth that we can ascribe to anyone or anything. The place that only God can and should occupy. Do you believe that Jesus holds that place? That is a big question. That is a big question. I believe that everybody in the pew because I call any people in the pew first, eh? everybody in the pew should truly ask themselves because that's going to answer the question of discipleship. That to me is it. Yeah, yeah. There are many cultural Catholics around today. They are Catholic because it is their culture. We need disciples who will worship him. That means bow down and give everything to him. Is a difference, I think. Is a difference. St. Paul says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, to view God's mercy and to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Romans 12. Do, do run from this, you know, because I want Romans. you, this is a big, 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 big thing by, 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 by St. Paul to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. This is critical because in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. I tell you, that's where people hesitate in. Yeah. Paul is my boy. You know? Paul is my boy. 
That's my confirmation name. Go on. And when and when you say offer your body as a living sacrifice, pleasing to God, that means everything about you is offered up to God, which means that every part of your life and your body is offered up to God. All. 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 Fellas outside there, Uncle Derek is still hesitating. All. I have a long road back. <laughs> All. So, we live in a time where conforming to the age is a pandemic or at pandemic levels. And there's so much con conforming to the age. The only way through this is to go back to the sources and see what they say. Transformation comes from the renewing of our mind through the encounter with Jesus Christ. That encounter leads to conversion, to discipleship, to communion and to mission. It leads ultimately, I think, to a new mindset, a, a new mental model that gives you a way of living that is, that is not how we're living right now. And that new mindset, I think, is vital for understanding the way forward. I really think so. Because <laughs> short of that, all we're doing is cultural Catholicism. Not good enough. And I wanted to hear this, that the renewing of the mind comes through the encounter with Jesus Christ, and that encounter leads to conversion, discipleship, communion, and mission. That's your parasita cycle. Eh? You come through the encounter to Christ, to conversion of heart, to discipleship, to communion, and to mission. Parasida, just to let you guys know, you know, who was one of the main authors of a Parasida? Our now Papa Francis. Papa, Our Francesco. Papa. Papa Francesco. And this is the wisdom that a Parasida really gave to us. Missionary discipleship came straight out of a Parasida. That's a disciple who is ready to form disciples. And you have to start thinking of discipleship not as one level, but as multiple levels. Just like you're going to kindergarten and then you go to, to primary, then you go to secondary, then you go to university, then you go to, to graduate. Well, discipleship is on all those levels also. We cannot change structures without a renewal of the mind, which is about conversion. And I am proposing three conversions that are necessary for the church in our time. All right, give us, give us, give us the three. The first conversion is to obedience to Christ. You know, the disciples, the first disciples where we went to worship Jesus because became his followers and allowed him to lead them in every way in their life. Here, Matthew 28, 16 to 20 says, is a guy, baptize them in the name of the Trinity, teach them to obey all that Jesus commands. So you, you, you go and you make disciples, you baptize them, you teach them to obey. But we're not teaching obedience to, to what Jesus commands, you know. We, we think it's a la carte that you, you could pick from the menu. You like this, you don't like that. You like this, you don't like that. Pick what you like and leave what you don't like. No, Jesus says, teach them to obey all that he commands. Obey, eh? that is the word. Word of the day. <laughs> Obedient. Here is the first yeah. conversion. To put God's will above everything else and to learn how to discern what is God's will in a better and better way every single day. This is this is the call of the Our Father. Your kingdom come, your will, will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. That's at the very heart of the Our Father. You know, you know my sin. You already know it. Bend by heart to your will. Your will, O God. 
<laughs> if you never hear me say that, I don't know. You must be the only people living in Jerusalem that do not know these things. <laughs> That's all I'll have to say about that one. Bend my heart to your will, O oh God. That's the first conversion. Obedience. Yeah, but, yeah, but that's a big challenge with us. A big challenge is obedience. And has always been an obedience from the time of Adam. Some are hesitating. <laughs> a disciple is one who gives God full worth. That means obedience is the first is the first level of discipleship there is no discipleship if you're not willing to be obedient to jesus christ do we dare put god and god's will first in things little and big in our lives this is the first threshold where we learn god's call and our vocation there is no discipleship without answering this call if this is difficult for you, that's okay. Stay here, wait, and pray, and beg God for the grace to come to the place where you consciously, freely, willingly want to be obedient to his will. And I share that with us, you know, early on in your own journey, you know, in your own journey. And, and I really appreciated that. And I share that sometimes, you know. If you have any, any doubts, you know, don't run. Don't run away, you know. Stay. Good. Stay. Go to the Blessed Sacrament and stay at the foot of the cross until such time as you stop hesitating and you're ready to, you're ready to give. So I would say, you know, if, if you're struggling there, that's okay. That's a stage of discipleship that you have to come to, face and move to the next stage. Stay there. Talk to a trusted friend. Talk to a priest. Talk to a spiritual director. Ask for help. Stay there. I, I like to tell people, go back to Matthew Kelly, the first book we gave out, which is Four Signs of a Dynamic Catholic. Go back to that. It, it has really the roadmap for discipleship 101. Go back to it. Our families, our schools, our parishes, our groups need to be schools of discipleship. And it can't be until we have disciples who are willing to obey the message of Jesus Christ and stay where it is painful to stay right now. Staying is painful. Staying is painful. Staying is painful. Painful. The second, the second step in the roadmap, census for day. The second conversion, that means the sense of the faithful. The second con conversion is accepting what the church teaches about the census for day. And in 2014, the Vatican issued a document on the sense of the faithful. And this requires belief in the church as the mystical body of Christ, that each disciple is connected to Christ, the head, and to each other. And the document says, the faithful have an instinct for the truth of the gospel, which enables them to recognize and endorse authentic Christian doctrine and practice, and to reject what is false. That supernatural instinct intrinsically linked to the gift of faith received in the communion of the church is called the census for day. So it is the supernatural instinct that is connected to Christ, intrinsically lift, linked to the gift of faith, received in the communion of the church. It's all three. So it's not just Everybody on the, on the block and on the street corner have senses for day. It is a, it is a quality of discipleship. And, and not only do we have to become disciples for the senses for day, day to kick into to our discipleship, but we have to become disciples to lead through the conversion to the senses for day. What do I mean by that? Many leaders believe that the, the, the faithful don't have a sense of the faith. 
and it doesn't make sense asking them any questions. Let me just tell them what to do. If we wanna, if we wanna disciple this generation, we have to believe that somehow and somewhere in there, they have a sense of the faith and they have a desire for it. And that they have a say in, in how to transmit faith to their generation. And we have to be willing and humble enough to be able to listen to that and to understand it requires different approaches, different processes, different tools. And we have to be willing for that. But I, I, you made that really clear. I, I, and, and I want to just, you know, just go back again to that, where we talk about this requires belief in the church as the mystical body of Christ. Yes. And all of us are connected to Christ as the head and to Baptism. each other. Through our baptism, we are integrally Amen. connected to Christ as a member of his body. Therefore, we are acting as part of the body of Christ. And it, I think it's an important piece because this second conversion to the census for day means that when I encounter people, I am, I am attuned to listening to how the Spirit is speaking through their voices. I'm not just bringing a word to them. I'm also attuned to listening how the Spirit is speaking through their voices, yeah. through their heart, through their taste. Through and their and this is where dialogue, in terms of our own synod, you know, spoke about dialoguing and dialoguing through inclusivity. You know, everybody, everybody, yeah. listening to everybody. Yes. The document says this, we have an instinct for the faith. We have an instinct for the faith. And I think that, that that is interesting. It's important. If we believe this, then we accept that synodality is a genuine method to achieve resource and ultimately a genomento, which is a renewal by going back to the sources. In our highly volatile culture, synodality is the best guarantee we have to put Christ at the center. If we see conversion in conversation in the spirit as a contemplative exercise, then synodality is a way of being church for our time. Amen. 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 So census for deity, you, you spoke about obedience. Where are we going? Where are we going next? So next we go into co-responsibility. Co-responsibility. And this term is, is, is another conversion. Huh? So I wanted to see the kind of first docility to Christ, so obedience to Christ. Second to census for day. That is that the Christ is speaking through every, every disciple. Through their connection with him, Christ is speaking through them. Therefore, I have to be attuned to listening through others to Christ. It's not just me and my Jesus. Huh? I have to be attuned to listening through others to Christ. Okay. This third one now says that I don't have all, I don't have it all. Because every baptized member is co-responsible for the mission of Jesus Christ. That's a big one. So the, the, this one, for, for 2,000 years, we've used worldly models for leadership. And, and Jesus debunks those models you know, in Matthew 20, 24. He says, you know, no, leaders are not supposed to be that way. The genuine leader is one who serves. And, and Jesus has put another model in there. The leader is a servant. And, and this is not a cliche. This is a reality. And when Pope Benedict XVI, in an address to the Diocese of Rome, was, was speaking about this, he used the term co-responsibility in describing the relationship of the laity to the mission of the church. And that requires a conversion of heart. Papa Benedict, boy, Papa Benedict, co-responsible, co-responsible. 
right? And he's saying this, he was describing the relationship of the laity, the laity. So, you know, you can't run away from the responsibility, laity. You are also part of the body of Christ and responsible for the mission of the church, which is critical. Mm -hmm. The understanding of co-responsibility really says that, you see, the former term was, was collaboration. Okay. Now, if you want to collaborate with me and I don't want to collaborate with you, that's the end of the story, you know. You, there's nothing you could do. I am the bishop, you are the deacon. There's nothing you can do. When you go to co-responsibility, that's different. Because by virtue of your baptism, you have a co-responsibility for the mission. The mission might be entrusted to me as the bishop, but you are co-responsible for that mission, which means that whether I want to collaborate or don't collaborate, you are still co-responsible for the mission. You still have a, a responsibility to say to me things that I may or may not want to hear. And also, because I don't want to, you don't want to collaborate with me, I leave. All right. Yes, but now it's not about leaving. Correct. About understanding that you have a share in the responsibility for the mission. Amen. Amen. Is understanding that. But this requires conversion apart. This is really a conversion. So in the code of canon law, the whole mission is entrusted to the bishops. Huh? And they collaborate with their priests, their deacons, their religious, and their laity. And Pope Benedict, they say, no, 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 no. According to the Second Vatican Council, if the whole people of Christ are called to holiness, the whole people of Christ are called to be co-responsible for mission. And that means the whole people of Christ have a responsibility to live out that mission and also to, to be part of the governance where the mission is contained and where the mission is, 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 is teased out. And what that is saying is that we all have a responsibility. And I think that, that isn't that so beautiful in terms of how Papa Francis now takes that and he brings this whole synod where everyone is invited. They have members from every part of the body of Christ into yeah. the synod process. All right, correct. So, who Benedict turns this and said, all baptized Catholics are co-responsible for the mission. That is for the church. This means that the whole people of God are involved in decision-making and decision-taking in the church at different levels with different responsibilities. And this, this role of the, of the leader is to ensure co-responsibility for mission at every level of the church. And this is why I'm saying that this calls for conversion of heart. Because if the leader wants to be large and in charge, then there's no co-responsibility. And there's no census for day. And then there's also no obedience to Jesus Christ. That's why I put these three as a three stepping stones to discipleship. Or the three levels, if you like, of discipleship. But, but you have to hear in co-responsibility and move away from clericalism. This is, I think more importantly, a move towards full, conscious, and active participation in all the baptized Catholics in the liturgy and the life of the church. Um, well, yeah, a whole new way of thinking of you know, I, I just watch how the from Holy Peter Fathers Peter. built on this, you know. I look yes. at the Holy Fathers from Vatican II building on top of each other. Correct. Correct. And that's why it's called for conversion. The role of the bishop and the priest and the deacon is to equip the laity to discern their vocation and to live it fully, offering their gifts for the building up of the body of Christ, which is, is Ephesians 1.4. Ephesians 4, um, verse 1 and following. That's, it. That's our role. To equip 
the census paid to listen deeply to, to be the will of God as we hear it through our people. And as we hear it direct from God too, both are important. Both are vitally important. So conclusion, the way forward for the church of our dream I, is really conversion to discipleship and putting God's will first in our lives. We all have a stake in this. When we come through conversion to the obedience to Christ, you come through conversion to census for day that you are ready and willing to hear the voice of God through the other voices and conversion to, to co-responsibility that I understand that I am not larger than in charge, that I have to share my, the responsibility to for the mission with those around me. Then we start having a discipleship that makes sense to God. Wow, I can't believe we, we went through this this conversation so quickly already, you know, because yeah. to me it was so packed with, you know, listening to, you know, what Christ's intended vision was all about, you know? Yes. yes. So, Archbishop G, we've come to the end of another Shepherd's Corner, and I think a very important one. Remember the book, eh? Remember the book, guys? He told us about the book. We Amen. need your prayer. We need your Amen. prayer and your blessing. And this is Easter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Father, we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we believe in the resurrection. And so we believe, oh God, that you can move our hearts to conversion and move us from, from the cultural discipleship that we have had, which is so convenient, to true discipleship in you, oh God where we come to obedience in you, where we come to listening to the sense of the faithful and being obedient to you, speaking in that way, where we come to obedience to you, O oh God, as you call us to be your people, this church who will be co-responsible with each other for the building up of your kingdom. We ask your blessings upon us, O oh God. Give us every grace. Alleluia, alleluia. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Guys, and I remember, I just, you know, one of the things that kind of stuck out to me today was transformation comes from the renewing of the mind through the encounter with Jesus Christ. And that encounter leads to conversion, discipleship, communion, and mission. God bless you. Thank you so much, Archbishop J. God bless you too.